Hello and welcome to the second part of this tutorial. Um, if you haven't already, please go watch the first part, otherwise you're going to be completely lost here. So what we're going to do now is to add some waves to our water shader and then find a way to have these waves influence the rigid bodies that we have created earlier. There are many ways to create waves via shader. I'll let you search for different techniques online, but today we're going to stick to a very simple technique. Uh, we are going to simply have a um, displacement map which will move some vertices upwards and then we're going to very simply pan the texture to have some movement. Okay, so without further ado, let's get started. Um, I will reuse the height map that I've set up in the first part of this tutorial, but um, at that time I didn't use it as a height map but as a way to lerp between two colors. So for now I'm just going to show you again how I set up the texture and how everything works. Okay, so the first thing that I have set up is world space UVs. That's what you can see here, where I use the absolute world position, which I then split and recombine into a vector 2 that is used as the UV. That allows us to um, actually not use any UV coordinates, but rather the world position of the object, which has two very important uh, properties, which we will see later. The other thing we're doing is we're using the time to have them uh, simply pan slowly and then a wave frequency property which basically decides how much tailing there is. This is used as the UVs of our sample texture LOD node. The LOD is very important otherwise you can't use it to displace vertices. And I'll show you right now the map uh, which is quite um, basically noise. Okay, so then this texture is used in order to lerp between two colors, but that's not really the point of this tutorial, so I won't show it too precisely. Um, now we'll see how we can use it to displace the vertices upwards. So the first thing we're going to need is to get the original position of the vertices. For that we use a position node that we will set to object space. Then to that position, we're going to add a vector which will displace the vertices. What vector will you ask? Well, um, an upwards vector that is going to be multiplied by the height map. So basically, where the height map is brighter, the vertices are going to go higher, and where the height map is darker, the vertices won't be raised at all. So we create a new vector 3 which we set to 0, 1, 0, which is basically upwards. We convert it to object space, and we're going to multiply it by another property, which is going to be our wave height. We're going to use a simple float for that. Then we're going to multiply that node with the height map. Finally, add that to our add node and connect it to our vertex position. Before giving it a try though, we're going to rename our properties. So this is our wave height. And what we're gonna do is not only set the properties names but also their reference. In case you don't know, the property name is what is going to be shown in the shader and the reference is what you need to type in order to access the shader property via script. So rather than to keep the default uh, crazy shader graph reference, we're going to rename them in the properties that we are going to need to access via script. These properties are waves height, waves frequency, waves speed, and waves displacement, which is the displacement map. Let's save it and give it a try. Okay, so as you can see, there's no waves. Uh, first thing, we're going to have to change the plane because the default plane uh, doesn't have a lot of vertices to displace, so you can't have uh, really any high-definition waves. 
So I'm going to change it for a more subdivided plane, which I made very quickly in Blender, but you could also make it directly inside Unity by using um, Pro Builder or U-Modeler. I'm then going to add the material to it. And it still does not work. Okay, so as it turns out, we had renamed the wave displacement property, so it was not set in the material anymore. So I'll just have to put it back. And here you go. Let's remove the shadows and then tweak the properties a bit. Okay, so I think we can all agree this is not a very great looking shader, but it should be enough to at least uh, explain to you how we can have rigid bodies interact with it. So first of all, let me showcase uh, why the world UVs can be very interesting in the case of an ocean. Let me move the plane around and as you can see, the texture does not follow the plane. Instead, it is anchored in world space. That means that, for example, if you just, uh, you know, parent the sea to the camera and then just move the camera, uh, you can quite easily um, have an infinite ocean, right? So here it's, you know, obviously you can see the edges and I'll show you in a bit how you can uh, expand on that. But very simply, you can move the camera around and have the uh, sea uh, be never-ending basically Okay, so now let's create a new script. There are a few ways we could have done that But I think the most interesting one is uh, by creating an ocean manager, which is going to uh, Control the ocean waves as well as the rigid bodies floating on it So we're going to copy the properties that we have set in the shader um, by creating a wave height wave frequency, wave speed, and a wave displacement map. We're also going to need a reference to our ocean game object and to its material. Here is the wave's displacement variable. As you can see, it has to be a texture 2D. So in the start function, we're going to need to set a few variables. But rather than to type it into the start function, I'm going to create a set variable function that will be called in the start function. And you'll see why uh, in a few seconds. So we need to get a reference to the material of the ocean, which is going to be done very easy by accessing the render of the ocean and getting its shared material. And then we're going to get the displacement waves from the material using the get texture function. Now this is why we had to give some sensible names to our properties. Then we're just going to call this one in the start function. We don't need any updates, however we're going to need a public function that will return a float um, from a vector3. Um, I call it water height at position and basically every rigid body that needs to know how high the sea is at any point is going to ask the ocean manager and the ocean manager will just return the height. Now to do that we need to take another look at our shader graph and basically uh, copy exactly the mathematical uh, formula that we're doing in shader but do them in code instead. But since we're doing it only for one position, it's much cheaper than to actually move every single vertex of the mesh. So to understand this formula, you have to know a bit about how UVs work and basically panning UVs is the same thing as adding a float to a U or the V property and how tiling UVs is basically the same as multiplying both the U and the V property. So it might be a bit complicated at first, but just copy it for now and hopefully uh, it will make sense. If it doesn't, you know, leave a comment and I'll try and explain it a bit more in depth. Or maybe you can find some great um, resources online. I mentioned Polytoots in the first video and actually all of this I learned from him. So if you have the time, go watch his videos and maybe it will be more clear. So what you're seeing here is basically the same as uh, editing the UVs 
what, as we do in the shader, we are multiplying the position by the wave frequency and then adding the panning that we add to the texture. So we are going to sample the green channel, but since it's in black and white, we could have sampled any one of the three channels. And then we're going to multiply it by the wave height and by the ocean scale, uh, because if we scale the mesh, it's going to mess up everything. So it has to be done that way. And finally to that, we're going to add the height of the ocean mesh. On validate is a function that is called every time we change something in the inspector. And it's why we had to create a set variable function so that if the ocean material is not set, we can set it, even if we're in edit mode. So what we're going to do is when we change the variables, wave height, frequency or speed um, in the inspector, it's going to actually update the shader so that we can have real time change of the ocean when we tweak variables of the ocean manager. We're just going to use the set float function, which allows us to pick a property of the shader and set it to its corresponding variable. All right, this is pretty much set up now. Now, in order to keep the same settings as we have right now, I'm just going to copy um, the basic tweakings that we've made. Now let's create a new game object, add the script to it, and we need to set the ocean mesh. Just drag it. And now, yay! So with the ocean manager, you can easily control um, anything about your ocean shader, which means that if you have some sort of weather system, you could very easily integrate it into that. Let's just now go back to our buoyancy object script and adapt it so that it can work with our ocean manager. So we don't need the water height variable anymore. However, we need to have a reference to our ocean manager. I'm simply going to get a reference to it in the start function by using find object of type. Maybe with a more complex system, you'd have uh, some kind of singleton, um, like a game manager that could have a reference to the ocean or whatever. This is simple enough for this tutorial. Finally, instead of just checking whether the height of the floaters is above or below the set water height, we're going to ask the ocean manager what is the water height uh, at the point of this floater. And we're going to use it to control the force that we add to the rigid body. As simply as that, it should be all updated. So I'm just going to fix now the ridiculously low variables. Um, by dividing them by 100 at every point in the script and by multiplying them by 100 in the inspector, which is going to make them a bit more readable. And we should now be all set to just try the floating system. Hit play. Mm-hmm. Okay, something's wrong. So as you can see, I had completely messed up the name of the property. But now it's fixed. And it works. It's quite satisfying to watch, really. We can then duplicate the rigid bodies as we please. And if we change any of the variables, in the ocean manager script, it will then update in real time for the rigid bodies and for the shader, so everything is unified. Let's stress test it a bit and see how the performance is. So as you can see, without any floating object, we are around 270 FPS, which is basically the default for HDRP, which is quite expensive. Let's add a few hundred uh, floating objects. And here we are about 200. 
so we lose, we lose about 70 fps uh, with 400 uh, floating objects which is both a lot and not a lot there are many ways that you could optimize it uh, for example you should have around your camera a big trigger sphere which is like maybe 100 meters or 200 meters uh, wide and basically just check if there are floating objects that enter or leave the sphere and when they enter you can set them to active rigid bodies and when they leave you can just set them to kinematic another thing you could do to optimize it is rather than to update the position of the rigid body every fixed update you could start a coroutine and maybe update it 10 times a second or 20 times a second now another thing that is pretty awesome about wall space uvs is that you can very simply duplicate the plane and you know move it a bit and it will be completely seamless with the other one but you will have a bigger plane that means that you can for example use lod systems we can then parent them to the uh, camera and for uh, something that is you know top down or at least where the camera is uh, looking pretty low that would actually be enough to have an infinite ocean so here we can just move around infinitely and have this uh, you know ocean now there's another thing you could do um, that I will show you and it's to have a special type of mesh that I've made here inside Blender. It's basically a circle and it's very subdivided at the center and then as you get further away from the center it's less subdivided. And when we add the ocean shader to it, as you can see we have pretty defined waves at the center and then as we get further apart they are more and more simple. That means that if we retake this technique that we had where we parent the ocean to the camera, we could, with this type of mesh, have a much bigger ocean uh, and basically really make it look infinite even in first or third person type of games. So here I'm just adding a bit of fog so that we can't see the limit of the ocean. Um, and yeah, this is basically the end of this tutorial. What's awesome is that it's completely integrated with rigid bodies. So if you want to make a boat controller, well, that's very easy. You just, you know, make a boat, add a rigid body to it, add the script that we've just made to it, and then a simple controller where you add a force forward when the player uh, presses W or, uh, you know, a torque, which is a rotation force when the player presses left or right. And that's very easy to do and that can make for a very fun mechanic. So try some things with it. Um, and if you have any questions, ask them in the comments or even better in the Discord. And see you next time.